webinar hosted by SACADETA Australia with our very special guest this afternoon, Karma Alexei Somo. We're so grateful to you for joining us. And thank you, thank you to all of you for joining us on this Sunday afternoon or whatever time it is where you are. As Joe said, I'm Helen Richardson and I'm president of SACADETA Australia. Now, I understand we have a couple of very special guests this afternoon. We have Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo, who's the current president of Sakadita International, and also a former president, Christy Chang. We're very honored to have you both with us, and thank you. Now to our very special guest. Welcome, Kamalek Somo. Venerable Karma was the co-founder of Sakadita International, and she organized the first Sakadita International Conference in Bodhgaya back in 1987. Sakadita grew from there with Karma Lekshe being a driving force in its development. She's a past president of Sakadita International and for many years was branch and chapter coordinator, helping organize conferences around the world. She's also professor of Buddhist studies at the University of San Diego and director of the Jamyang Foundation, an education project for women in developing countries. Inuakama Lecture has studied Buddhism since the 1950s, when she was 11 or 12. And she was a pioneer in assisting Tibetan Buddhist nuns in their studies and education. She's a longtime supporter of women's right in, rights in Buddhism. We've asked her this afternoon to speak on the history of Sakadita International, how and why it was formed, and what it was like for women and nuns in Buddhism those decades ago. Also, how things have developed and about her hopes for the future. Venerable Lekshe, welcome. Perhaps we could begin with a little meditation. Very good idea. Thank you very much, Helen and Joe, and everyone who's helped to put this event together. Uh, we're so impressed with what Australia Sakadita is doing and um, the wonderful conference that was held and what uh, all the great events that you're holding. So I want to express my thanks to all of you. Um, let's start with just a few moments of mindfulness just to get settled in, uh, grounded, and in community in a way. Let's just take a few moments um, relaxing wherever we may be and staying in touch with ourselves, our bodies, and each other. Thank you. Not sure if you might be hearing the shakuhachi in the background. Yes. But, yes. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Yeah, that's the neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> that's the party. <laughs> Thank you, Karma Lekshe. Now, I have some questions for you. So, as you said, you began studying Buddhism in the 1950s, or as you told me. And Buddhism wasn't well known in the West then, like it is now. So how did you become interested in Buddhism? Well, my family name was Zen. Really? And, um, yes, it's a German name, misspelled at immigration, no doubt. But because I had this name, Zen, uh, the kids at school used to tease me about being a, a Zen Buddhist, and I had to find out what it was. So when I went to the public library, and look for books on Buddhism, I found only two books, uh, The Way of Zen by Alan Watts and Zen Buddhism by D.T. Suzuki. So that was my introduction. And I was just a kid, but I, I read them with great interest and I felt like coming home. So I was really fortunate with that, yeah, that I just dived right in as a young kid. <laughs> <laughs> and from there, and I, I gather after you finish school, you went to India. Now, how difficult was that for you personally, studying all those years ago in India and in Dharamsala? Well, the living conditions in India in those days were pretty meager. 
Um, there were only a few vegetables in the market. We had to carry kerosene up from the village, all provisions, struggle over a kerosene stove. Half the time there was no water. Um, you know, it was hugely hot in the summer and terribly cold in the winter and all kinds of varmints and, you know, visa difficulties. And, you know, we were all quite poor at that time. So I must say that we had to overcome quite a lot of obstacles, but we felt that it was worth it because we had an opportunity to study the Dharma. And in Dharamsala at that time, thanks to the vision of His Holiness, there were classes being held at the Tibetan Library, the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives, where we could study Dharma four hours a day with these great masters and learn a little Tibetan on the side. So it was a great opportunity. Yeah, I'm very grateful. Uh, and when and why did you decide to become a nun, to take that next step? Hmm. Well, I'd always had the dream of becoming a nun since about the age of 19. But, you know, life got in the way and I went in many different directions. Maybe it's a good thing, you know, to do, you know, live out your dreams in a way. But eventually I was fortunate. Um, after teaching yoga and, you know, being a translator and traveling the world, I was a musician, I did so many different things. But I was always determined to become a nun. I just wanted two things in life, to become a nun and to learn Tibetan. I had no I, intention of starting a monastery, no idea about an international Buddhist women's association. It was, that was totally unplanned. So given that, how did Sakyadita start? What, what inspired it? What was its genesis? Well, you know, in the 19, um, 1980s, mid-80s, about 86, um, I noticed that people were coming by and they were having a really rough time. Um, women of all different nationalities, especially the nuns, were experiencing lots of hardships, trouble getting um, teachings, education, uh, a place to stay, something to eat. I mean, the situation of nuns in those days was, I think we could say truly terrible. <laughs> and um, so we thought we should get together and try to talk about it. Uh, see if we could do something to understand the problem and, and do something about it. So Aya Kemba was down in Sri Lanka. Chatsuman Kabul Singh was in Thailand. She was still a laywoman, a professor. But we were in correspondence by mail. In those days, you know the thing on the paper where you write with a pen? <laughs> yeah, we had to send letters back and forth by post. And well, nothing against the Indian postal system or anything, but we were, you know, you're lucky if one in three letters made it through. So we started out with the idea of getting women from different countries together to talk about these critical issues. And this just grew into a, a beautiful gathering in Bodh Gaya. So we were amazed. So that was the first conference in, in Bodh Gaya. Um, right. And after that, what happened? How, how did you get things up and running? Well, um, why don't I show you a few slides to illustrate if I can figure out, now where are the slides supposed to be? Sure. Ah, share a screen. Sure. Okay. Okay, can you we see? Can see yes, we can see those. Can you see all of them or just the main one? The main one, Sakidita, and the others on the side. Oh, okay, so let's just ditch the ones on the side. Okay, now, okay, so, um, you know, it all started, of course, with Mother Maya giving birth to the Buddha and women having a, a critical role in the Buddhist tradition from the beginning. Um, we have the legend or the story of Mahapajapati, the first Buddhist nun, who was the Buddha's stepmother. And she was probably the first Buddhist feminist 
led a, a procession across northern India to advocate for the rights of women to be ordained and join the Sangha. There were thousands of nuns at the time of the Buddha and women who listened to the Buddha's teachings and felt so moved, so, um, so keen on achieving liberation. And we have their stories. The, they say that the first poetry uh, known to be written by women were these stories of the early Buddhist nuns recorded in the Terigata. We have the story of Sangamitra, who took um, the Dharma to Sri Lanka and started the order of Buddhist nuns there uh, in Sri Lanka about um, two or three hundred years um, before Christ. We have the story of Hema who hid the tooth relic of the Buddha in her hair. I think she pinched it actually and <laughs> took it down to Sri Lanka. So she's very famous there too. Um, we know that the Buddhist teachings originally were supposed to be for everyone. Uh, laymen, laywomen, ordained men, ordained women. But somehow women have not played a central role in most Buddhist traditions. We have, um, today, we have nuns in Laos, um, often on the margins, um, in Burma, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, um, the Lay women and nuns are, are very strong. They have one of the largest bhikkhuni sanghas in the world. In Korea, the position of nuns is quite good, and women do get education. Um, in the Himalayas, there's been something of a lag in education, but we're catching up now. Um, so here we start with the first Sakadita conference in Bodhgaya in 1987, where we actually focused on the situation of the nuns, because that is what needed attention, um, definitely needed attention. <laughs> uh, then we moved to Sri Lanka in 1993, and, oh, I'm missing a few there, but Cambodia in 1997, Nepal in 2000, to Taiwan in 2002, Korea 2004, Malaysia in 2006, Mongolia 2008, Vietnam the beginning of 2010, Thailand, 2011, Vaishali, um, the village where the Buddha's stepmother became the first Buddhist nun. We thought we should honor her, so we held the conference there in 2013. Then Hong Kong in, oh, we're missing Indonesia in 2015 and now Hong Kong in 2017, then Australia in 2019, just last year. So these conferences have led to a lot of changes. Our big focus at the first one, uh, everyone agreed, was education. It just did not seem proper that so many of the nuns were lacking the opportunity to study the Buddha's teachings. In some traditions, women were illiterate. And so there was this huge gap between education for monks in the monasteries and the situation of women who were not allowed to join those monasteries. So now um, we see that the women are having the opportunity to participate in all the rituals, almost all. Uh, they're getting meditation instruction. They're even achieving the highest degree in philosophy, the Geshe degree. And the remaining um, sort of challenge, I guess we can say, is full ordination for women in all the different Buddhist traditions. There's still a number of traditions where women don't have that opportunity. So um, the, this generation, the younger 
women today have many opportunities, both in the secular sphere and in Buddhism. Many of them don't realize how difficult it was for earlier generations. Um, but we've come a long way. <laughs> so, and a lot of this, I must say, is due to the hard work and good communications, networking among Buddhist women of the world. So, so that's the story. That's how it all began. And that's how it's progressed over the last 30 years. And um, I think we can all be quite proud of the achievements of Buddhist women in that period of time uh, in many different fields, research and translation and publications. I mean, when we started, there, were, there was just one book from 1930, a wonderful book called Women Under Primitive Buddhism. Um, but that was about all we had to go on. And now we, we can hardly count the number of books and articles that have been written about Buddhist women in all the different Buddhist traditions. Mm. So quite remarkable. <laughs> um, seeing that slide of the conference in 1987, I've been remiss, I've been reminded that there's another of uh, Sakadita's past presidents with us who is Ranjani da Silva, who's with us with the nuns from Newbury. So we'd yes. like to welcome you. It's, it's lovely to have some of the past presidents with us. And she's told us a bit about that, uh, those, those early conferences in, um, in Bodhgaya in Sri Lanka. But it, it seems to me it was, it's been an enormous amount of work to, to do all you've done with those conferences and really to get things up and running. Well, there are challenges involved in doing something international with almost no budget. Um, we've, we started every conference with about zero, the f at least the first um, 14 conferences, we really had no resources. And yet, people would come on their own, um, you know, on their own, paying their own expenses. And this is how Sakadita has managed as a purely volunteer organization. So we've never had any paid staff. Everyone has worked as a volunteer, which has made things much more difficult in certain ways. But in other ways, it means that everyone who is involved is working from their heart, not in hopes of, you know, getting a job. They, we don't stop, you know, at five o'clock and go home. We just uh, continue until the job is done. So that's been wonderful, really. Um, another challenge, of course, is language. Um, we were working with um, over 40 different languages and we've been trying to get as many publications in different languages as possible. I think the Indonesians and the Vietnamese are, are leading the pack on this one. They've all published at least five of the Sakadita volumes in their own languages, which is amazing. And um, the other difference, uh, the other one more challenge, of course, is culture. We're coming from very different places in terms of our upbringing, our education, our expectations, our modes of communication. Even the food that we eat is different. And it's so interesting that we can all get together and somehow find common ground. I think that Buddhist women can be very proud that in a sense, We've been the ones who have been the leaders in this kind of intercultural communication, certainly among the Buddhists, because the Sakadita conferences are not just photo ops where people posture and, well, <laughs> we, actually, oh. we actually take on substantive issues and we really try to communicate with one another and learn from each other's experiences and ideas. So that's just some of the challenges and achievements. So, Venerable, what have been the particular problems in the Sangha with the nuns? Um, and, and what has been your involvement in the effort and the struggle to bring full ordination to nuns? Okay, um, those are two questions, I think, that both uh, deserve attention. Um, one, to begin with the first one, what's happened is from the Sakadita conferences, many of us have gone on to 
initiate projects in different areas. A lot of them have been education projects. Some have been women's shelters. Some have been retreat centers. Some have been hospices. Some have been you know, publications and research work. People have gone in their own directions, different directions, which together has really been amazing. Um, when we look at it from a, a, micro, a macro view, you know. Um, and so, um, for example, Jetsuma has a, a monastery with education projects. I've also begun quite a few of them through John Young Foundation. Um, and other people have, have contributed in other ways. So, um, so this has been really, really important. Now, the second part of your question, can you elaborate a little bit on where you were going with that? Um, well, I, I believe it was quite a struggle some decades back for nuns to get full ordination. And uh, I wondered what was your involvement in that? Okay, so this issue of ordin full ordination was also an integral part of the first conference. It was raised from the very beginning. Um, mind you, when I got ordained as a nun in the Tibetan tradition in 1977, I didn't know that the Tibetans didn't have full ordination for women. I mean, that's how naive I was. <laughs> and, and yeah, it was quite um, a wake up call when I found, figured it out because a couple of my teachers had been bhikkhunis, but I didn't realize that they had gone to Hong Kong to get ordained. So at the very first Sakadita conference in Bodh Gaya, there was a contingent of 16 uh, women and a few men from Sri Lanka. And they really um, hit on this idea of bhikkhuni ordination. They did not realize that the ordination was still available in the world. And they became so inspired and, and fired up really about this idea of restoring the bhikkhuni ordination in Sri Lanka that they took it and ran with it. Because I, I just showed you the picture of Sangamitra, who was the daughter of Emperor Ashoka, who took the bhikkhuni lineage from Northern India down to Sri Lanka and ordained Queen Anula and hundreds of Sri Lankan women. But that tradition, which lasted up to the 11th century, had been discontinued, probably due to famines and wars and so on. Fortunately for us today, some Sri Lankan nuns transmitted that lineage to China in the 5th century CE, and where it has thrived and continued up to the present day. And from China, the lineage was then passed to Korea, Taiwan, Vietnam, and now around the world, Singapore, Malaysia, and so on. So this um, idea of restoring the bhikkhuni lineage was one activity that Sakadita took up, and we're still working on it. In fact, Sri Lanka is the success story because they've managed, it's not a complete success, mind you, there are still difficulties to be overcome. But about half of the nuns in Sri Lanka are now fully ordained. And um, in Thailand, in, there are about, we're told there are about 200 fully ordained nuns now. And in Indonesia and um, Nepal, has done a wonderful job. There are about 400 fully ordained nuns in Nepal. So little by little, um, this has become a, a, a possibility for women. Of course, only a few will decide to become nuns. But if we're going to talk about human rights, we need to look at religious rights. And if women don't have access to full ordination, then women don't really have equal rights in Buddhism, which, I think is a violation of the statute on human rights. So, so that's why we have gotten active on that as one issue among many. And we're still working on it. Yeah. Um, just going back, just remind us of the Buddha's attitude to women and the possibility of enlightenment for women. Well, we have a very clear statement attributed to the Buddha that women are capable of achieving the fruits of the path. 
that would be stream and enter once returner, non returner, and arhat, or a fully liberated being. So this is really, really puts the Buddhists ahead of the pack in terms of women's opportunities, because the Buddha himself affirmed the potential of women to achieve the highest goal. Um, it gets more complicated after that, because at, while the Buddha was alive, he was able to ensure that the nuns were treated fairly. After he passed away, I think that women once again struggled because societies around the world still seem to be operating on this patriarchal model. So we find that while there are many stories of great monks throughout Buddhist history, we have very few stories of, of Buddhist women. Um, but that's been part of Sakadita's work, has been recovering those stories. And people have been researching the history. They've, they've uncovered many biographies of women in the Tibetan tradition, for example. They've just published a whole compendium in Tibet, compendium of biographies of Buddhist women. This is extraordinary. And we hope that we can do the same in other traditions as well. So, no, sorry. So put it down to patri patriarchy. <laughs> and how does patriarchy reassert itself? Um, these are the questions that we need to investigate. Because here we are in the 21st century, and we see how things are going. I mean, our, our governments, now New Zealand's doing pretty well. And um, recently they were showing the portraits, the photos of nine world leaders who had really handled the coronavirus um, pandemic well, and they were all women. And they even forgot the president of Taiwan. Which, who should also be included because Taiwan is doing just about the best of any country right now. So um, this is how, I guess maybe we just need to keep reminding people. <laughs> mm. um, I just like to um, remind all our participants that we will be taking your questions. And if you'd like to ask um, Alexei Somo a question, just type it into the group chat and we'll get onto those fairly soon. Um, Kamalekshe, in a very recent newsletter, you wrote that women are not second-class Buddhists. So is, is that still the perception that in Buddhism that women are second-class Buddhists? Well, I mean, we can see it everywhere. We can see that in the seating arrangements in many Buddhist countries and Buddhist Dharma centers, um, we'll see men positioned ahead of women. And um, often, um, in terms of education and so forth, uh, which is how we nurture teachers for, for the Buddhist tradition, uh, there's, there are huge gaps between the uh, possibilities open to women and the possibilities open to men. Men still have far greater uh, access to the Buddhist teachings. They're much better supported than women. So I, I can speak more uh, to the question of the nuns because the nuns um, are generally reliant on the lay community for their sustenance. And I can assure you that they do not get anywhere near the support that the monks do, which is peculiar because the donors are primarily women. But many women still are very male identified and they prefer male teachers, they prefer to support men uh, and men's projects. So this is uh, something that we need to explore. Why is this? Um, is it years of conditioning? And if so, how do we get rid of it? <laughs> <laughs> so so how, how do you suggest? <laughs> Well, I think that's why Sakadita was initiated, was to try to acknowledge that women have a tremendous potential uh, for helping uh, correct the injustices in our troubled world. Mind you, gender injustice is just one of many problems that we're facing. Uh, but 
economic injustices affect women more than men. Um, that's even in the United States, 40% of the homeless population is women and children. You see, just in small indicators like this, we can see that um, in the job market, uh, economically, women are often at a disadvantage. And in promotion, and, and I, even at the university, you know, being heard, women's voices need to be heard. So Sakadita has become a forum where Buddhist women's voices could be heard. And I'm, I must remind people that before 1987, Buddhist conferences were almost entirely male. Uh, in fact, most even until today, mostly they're male. Male-dominated. The speakers are mostly men. The organizers are mostly men. The decisions are mostly made by men. So... Women have had difficulty being hurt. Sometimes we've tried to infiltrate these organizations, but it doesn't work out very well because they'll have us doing all of the work. But this, the idea of us actually having something worthwhile to share in terms of ideas um, is not well received in, in many cases. So we become tokens. And that's not what we had in mind. So Sakadita is a forum that's open to everyone. Men, women, lay ordained, neither lay nor ordained, um, of all backgrounds, of all nationalities, and all Buddhist traditions. So I think that we can credit Sakyadita also as being a forum where people of all different tra Buddhist traditions can come together, and also all different religious traditions. We've had a lot of interreligious dialogue over the years, very productive dialogue, I must say, on a very deep level, because in many respects, the issues, the, the challenges facing Buddhist women are also shared by women in other religious traditions, and we can learn from each other. Uh, the, Catholic, so, uh, the Catholic women are, are far ahead of the Buddhists in many regards, in terms of hermeneutics, you know, going back to the text and explaining them from a, women's pers a woman's perspective. Um, wow, the Catholics have been doing this for 50 years now, and we've barely begun, you see? So in these ways, we can learn from each other. Uh, that's quite remarkable. And also, you know, this idea of getting the different traditions together to chat in their different languages. I believe Sakyadita started this in 1987 when we asked, you know, the Pali speakers, those who chat in Pali, I should say, to recite. And then we'd go alphabetically, you know, China, Japan, Korea, um, Vietnam, Tibet, uh, and so forth. So that everyone got an opportunity to, like, strut their stuff, you could say, but to also to demonstrate how similar we are, and yet the beautiful variation, especially when many of them would recite the Heart Sutra in all the different languages, you know, and we're just wait for it, the gate, gate, paragate, in different uh, tones, different accents. It's really beautiful. <laughs> I've just got a couple more questions, Venerable, and then we'll um, hand it over to the questions coming in from our participants. But um, perhaps I misunderstood, but has there been a bit of a backlash from the ma from male Buddha Buddhists about Sakadita? I think there was quite a lot in the beginning. Um, the, the men who come to the Sakadita conferences, of course, are very respectful, <laughs> um, but they're very few. So I think mostly, as often happens with women's movements, the strategy that a lot of men have used is simply to ignore us. Um, they ignore us in the academy. Uh, Buddhist women's research is often not taken seriously. Um, well, it's just by a woman. It can't possibly be worth reading or quoting or, you know, citing or right, engaging with. And so often, even the many Dharma centers, the topic of women is simply not on the table. I know that I'm blacklisted in a few 
organizations because I'm a feminist. And I guess some people have a problem. Of course, if you're not a feminist, you haven't been paying attention. But um, so I think that there's still a lot of work to do to really bring women fully into the conversation. Now we can see that over the years, in the last 30 years, women have been making it into publications more and more. And this is really an important, important step, important breakthrough. Uh, not all publications, mind you. And yes, okay, it took about 30 years, but that's okay as long as in the end, and it's not just one issue. You know, first there was one issue, but now it's really clear that women's issues are up front and center for a lot of people. And therefore, these uh, publications, these uh, magazines are taking notice. And we're, we can go deeply, they're hearing from more people. It's really wonderful. And you know, well, you've, you've done so much for Buddhist women over the past um, four or five decades. What, what, what do you see is the key, the most important changes that you've been able to bring about? Well, this alliance of Buddhist women, this network around the world is really, really important. We can see that now. Here we are in the middle of a global pandemic. And yet, uh, those of us who are privileged to have uh, access to a computer and to the internet, which at last figure I heard is 1% of the world's population, um, are able to communicate with each other um, online. So this is really amazing and, and wonderful. So using this technology, I think that we can continue going forward. What we need to do is try to bring more people into the loop. So creating this international alliance. Um, of course, right now, we use mostly English medium. And that is a limitation um, since only about a quarter of the world's population speaks English, is comfortable with English. So that would be even more so in the case of Buddhist women. Um, and we've noticed this, that's why we've tried so hard to provide translation at the Sakyadita conferences. And it's not an easy thing to find translators who are competent and willing uh, to serve as volunteers to help translate into other languages, but it's vitally important because we really want to hear from each other. We don't want the Buddhist women's movement to be dominated by particular voices. And, and this is very challenging because already by virtue of speaking English, we are privileged. We are one subset of Buddhist women which is not at all representative of Buddhist women as a whole. 99% um, of Buddhist women live in Asia, and most of them are either poor or living under oppressive governments or um, illiterate um, or lacking access to Buddhist education. So we have so much work to do on this level, and I hope that we can always remember that, that we are the privileged ones who, who are fortunate to get a Buddhist education, who can go down without a credit card and buy a Buddhist book. And, right, you know, yeah. that's incredible. So I'll go to questions in just a moment, but, but what, are your, what are your hopes, looking at the future, what are your hopes for Sakadita in the future? And what can realistically be achieved? Well, that's my biggest hope, is that we can bring all Buddhist women along together. Because if we're going to talk about gender justice, we have to talk about it in large strokes. We can't just think about gender justice for white women, for the privileged women. No, we have to find ways to reach out and try to raise up the levels of um, awareness and education, health and um, communications among all Buddhist women. And I know it's, it's, um, it seems like an impossible dream, but remember everything we've done sounded like an impossible dream 30 years ago, yeah. 33 years ago, right? 
the idea of having an international a Buddhist alliance, alliance of Buddhist women. Really, some very knowledgeable people sat me down and said, no, it's too early. It will never work. Give up. You're killing yourself. Let it go. Mm -hmm. Really. But ha had I listened to them, where would we be today? The, the nuns would still be sitting behind the dogs at the pub public teachings. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've really come a long way. So I think uh, look, we need to look at the successes, but also not shy away from the tremendous challenges. Okay. And um, I think that's why I raised the, the issue of, of privilege, because we need to have that awareness before we can really open our minds and uh, try to make links with women in other countries. Now, when I say help, I don't mean it in a patronizing way. Yes, okay, we have helped um, to institute education projects in, in many different countries, and that's vitally important. But then we also need to make sure that the communication is two-way, that it's not dominated by the highly educated, the, the privileged who tend to be white, which is yes. not a fault. It's not a, it's not a moral, you know, failing to be white. Um, sometimes it can even work as an advantage, but, but there's much more to the picture than simply our own interests. So I appreciate that Sakadita Australia uh, has in its bylaws, um, in its objectives to reach out to all the Buddhist communities. And I hope that all of the branches of Sakyadita will also do likewise. So this is what I would like to see. I would like to see more people um, included in the conversation, meaning, uh, and that means that we have to grapple with uh, issues of language and culture. Sometimes we, we offend people not without even knowing it. Mm. There are different ways of being in the world that are especially valued in women in Asia and Buddhist cultures. To be humble and so forth is the main one. So sometimes the way we behave is really offensive, but mm. we don't realize it, right? Mm. So I think maybe learning more about these modes of communication. Um, yes, and also learning to see both sides so that we can broker some of the misunderstandings that arise around that kind of miscommunication. Now, I don't just mean here to make a divide between uh, Asian and Western. That's something of an artificial divide because, you know, many of us have lived in Asia for extensive periods of time, and many Asian women have also studied and lived in Western countries for extensive periods of time but we also need to bridge all the different gaps that could potentially cause misunderstandings and see if we can learn communication skills that can help to resolve some of these differences and, and, and make it a richness, a diverse, make, uh, help us to discover the richness of diversity. Mm. That's a lot to work on, thank you. Um, look, I'll, I'll um, come to questions now, but I've just been told by Newbury Monastery that they've set up the webcam for Ranjani, and I was wondering if um, Joe or Jack could um, give us that view. Is it possible to pinpoint Ranjani? But in the meantime, I'll read out um, a question that's come in from Judith McDonald. She's saying, it's lovely to see you, Kamalekshe. Thank you. My question is, what effect do you think the present pandemic will have on Buddhist nuns? And how can Sakadita work to relieve this? Oh. Yeah, well, this pandemic is going to change everything. It's, going to, it's, it's, it's changed the world. Um, there's no question about that. And we can see that in this forum. You know, instead of flying down to Australia, <laughs> here we are meeting online, which is a wonderful thing. Yeah. Um, it also means that a lot of people are cut off. Those without telecommunications are, are cut off. And I'm uh, personally responsible for these, you know, 400 nuns in India and 128 children in Bangladesh. And, and as soon as this forum is finished, I have to try to see how we can get them some food. So how do you get food in a country under lockdown? 
So you and I may be able to just ring the, the market and get it delivered or, you know, drive down to the local, you know, shop during the, the old folks hours or whatnot. But, but most people are not that fortunate. I mean, India is a tinderbox. So um, I think we'll, we need to set up some um, channels for providing uh, support for women in various countries as this pandemic. Let's hope that it comes under control. Uh, I mean, our prayers and our good thoughts and our um, sending loving kindness around the world is very powerful. Uh, and there's more that we can do also. So I think keep, keeping tabs, as depressing as it is to keep tabs on how this thing is going, some of us have to because we're responsible for so many people. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Jack. What can Sakidita do to further highlight women Buddhist teachers and nuns to help improve the status of women in Buddhism and society at large? Maybe a plus side of sexism is that the great teachers of our time are more available. So there is a rich resource there for both male and female students to learn from. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think um, now today there are more women teachers and what you're doing here by inviting a woman teacher to address the, the gathering is an example of how we can simply make sure we bring women teachers in. Give women an opportunity to develop the skills of teaching. I lived in India for 15 years. I was never once asked to give a talk. Not once. It was not done. Only men could be teachers. And we still see that a lot in, in Buddhist societies and even in Western countries. If you, if you really want an authoritative answer, ring a male, right? But women have to see that this is limited thinking. We just have to break through that misconception that only men have the authority to teach Buddhism. So by inviting women teachers, by making sure that at Buddhist conferences, at least half the speakers, not simply the organizers, not, a, not one session at nine at night, no, that women are fully integrated into, in the conference, that they have a voice in the planning, what topics are raised. I remember a Buddhist conference in Berkeley where there was only one panel on women and someone challenged Aya Kema. So why do we have a, a whole panel on Buddhist women? She said, because there's no other panel that has women on it that's talking about women's issues. Now that's 30 years ago. Now we see women more and more invited to speak, but I remember not long ago that someone organized a conference about the bhikkhuni issue, and they had nine speakers, all male. Um, and when that happens, we have to gently, politely call them out on it, because it's no longer acceptable. So we have responsibility to make sure that women's voices are included in all levels, from start to finish, not just in the kitchen. And then we have to if we see that it's all men on the mic, all women in the kitchen, quietly work for change. Mm. Okay, um, here's another question. I'm not quite sure who it's from. How do you keep compassion when witnessing gender inequality and disre disrespect towards women, especially in Buddhism? It confuses and saddens me. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty infuriating, <laughs> actually, um, and the fact that it's happening even now, even today, even in, you know, circles where people should know better, among educated people, it's still happening. So I think that it's most important under the circumstances to practice loving kindness, both for people on both sides, the ones who are perpetrating this a kind of gender violence, yeah? and the ones who suffer from it. We need to generate loving kindness for both, both sides and stay calm. Okay, when I say call people out, we have to be skillful. We have to develop strategies. Um, 
to be effective in making change. Confrontation, this is one thing that I think all the Sankarita organizers have learned is that direct confrontation doesn't work. In fact, it can put the movement back. All someone has to do, if a woman loses it, that incident will be trotted out for years to come. I'm still hearing it, you know? Um, if one woman appears arrogant, it will be all over the world. Now, men are assertive, women are bossy, right? We know this. We know that the standards are, are gendered, are unjust. Um, but since we know that, I think by using compassion and loving kindness, we can develop strategies that work. Okay, this is the main thing. Keep the eye on, our eye on the prize and, and try to develop forums where women are equally represented and heard. Thank you. That question was from Elizabeth. And another one, I I'm, think it's from Jo. Uh, Venerable, what do you see as the priority activities for Sakadita International? Well, um, at the moment, the international conferences have been primary uh, because they have been integral, they have been essential for our work in bringing Buddhist women around the world together. Um, there's so much more we could be doing. Uh, what we've also been focusing on is strengthening the national branches and nurturing the national branches. Um, in, sometimes it takes years to get a national branch started for various reasons. Sometimes there are government interference um, and uh, obstacles, right? In some cases, the people in that country just are too far flung geographically. In some cases, the people in that country don't get along. And that has really undone some of our national branches. So that's something we have to look at carefully too. Um, effective organization. None of us are trained. I'm not trained in organizational management. Um, I'm learning communication skills on the fly. Many of us are, right? Um, but we need to do that, and more of us need to do it. We need to somehow bring in women who have skill, um, all different kinds of skills that we can learn from. And more and more, it's going to be technological skills because I think that everything is going to change. You know, the idea of getting on a plane and going to a foreign country is it's not going to be attractive for a lot of people from here on. And therefore, we've got to be prepared. Uh, well, we need to be prepared ourselves psychologically that we're not going to probably be running around the world like we have been and also be prepared to present our ideas and our, our platform for changing the world in more and more attractive ways um, beyond as you know some of the you know lecture format workshop format artistic formats we need to get more and more creative uh, and appeal to people of all different sort of interest groups and starting young too we need a whole new generation. There are lots of young Buddhist women out there. I was just at a Goenka retreat with a hundred young people. Uh, Two thirds were women. Amazing, so beautiful. And so they're out there. We just need to figure out ways to link up with them. Um, Kamalakshay, the next question is related to technology. It comes in from Liv. Um, Kamalekshe, I've just participated in a virtual retreat. Is it possible for one of the nuns to conduct a similar event? And then she says, thank you for speaking today and all your effort over the years. Thank you. Um, yes, definitely. It's possible for nuns to lead meditation retreats online. In fact, there's one this weekend with Sangye Khandra on death and dying out of Seattle. It's actually being done from Washington State from Shravasti Abbey. And um, I'm not sure if people know Venerable Sangye Khandro, but she's an American nun who taught in Singapore for many years. She's a wonderful teacher. So they got that all set up 
with a schedule and people can log on, you know, go, follow the links. And I did it myself yesterday. It's so beautiful. So yes, I think we want to organize more and more of these. It's an excellent idea. And we just need people to help us with the technology and organization. Yeah. Mm. Good. Particularly technology, as you said, into the less developed countries. Yes, exactly. Um, we're running out of time. We've just got a few more minutes. Um, I'd like to ask you about your Jam Young Foundation, the education project that you're directing. Ah, yes. Okay. Well, during those early years, um, in fact, before Sakadita got rolling, um, I noticed that the nuns didn't have access to education. In fact, many of the nuns coming from Tibet were illiterate. And they had been nuns since they were children, but they'd never been taught to read. They learned their prayers by heart, by memory, and they were so sincere and dedicated, but they had no access to the depth of the Buddhist teachings because they couldn't read the text. So we started with a literacy project in Dharamsala. And it grew as we added more and more classes, Tibetan language, philosophy, English, and so on. Now, Jamyang Chuling is, has 150 nuns, and six of them became Geshe's in the first batch. So this is how quickly things can change if women have the tools, the skills that they need. So we can help by supporting so Ooh. to gain those skills, right? Mm -hmm. So um, this includes um, food. It's not very sexy, but they need to eat. They need a place to stay. They need education. They need health care. It's pretty basic. And so we've continued, um, and now there are 12 projects in India, 12 monasteries where the nuns have education programs. Um, some are... Uh, very intense with the whole you know debating philosophy and all of that and some are simpler mom rim instruction and so forth but this is this is how it got started and it continues to this day so and there are many other projects um, that others have started as well these projects are going they're moving ahead despite all the obstacles yeah that especially things like women are stupid uh, women aren't interested in studying. Women can't do philosophy, uh, and so on. And women tend to integrate. They s tend to buy into these misconceptions about women and therefore themselves. And it, it poses quite um, an obstacle, a powerful obstacle to moving forward. So helping to encourage, and that's why we have a volunteer program. Okay. So this is going to change also. We've had to cancel our volunteer programs for this summer. But for the last 20 years, we have had volunteers come up to the Himalayas and teach in our programs, which has been a really rich cultural exchange. And you can read the uh, stories of the volunteers on the Jamyang Foundation website. Thank you. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, another question from Elizabeth. She says, is there any way we can participate in a Dharma talk? I think she perhaps means Dharma teachings with yourself. Oh. <laughs> um, actually, if someone wanted to organize something, I'd be very happy to. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And uh, we are out of time. It's uh, six o'clock in Australia. But um, we, we've had a request from Ranjani. She wants to say something, and we'll um, pinpoint her for that. Ranjani. Thank you, Helen, for organizing all this. And lovely to hear your voice. Venerable Lexisomo. <laughs> now it's 33 years of Sakyadita, and list, listening to all the achievements today, it's it's beautiful to hear all the i still remember at the beginning when we formed the sakya dita we named the conference sakya dita and we made the resolutions and the, i think all the resolutions we made have been achieved achieved so 
we are happy now and i am here at the newbury monastery with monastics we have we have bhikkhunis and monks and anagarikas and and they are so kind to arrange all this use the technology to uh, for me to be uh, present here and to talk to you these few words yes thank you everybody lovely to again yes see you thank you ranjani and thank you for all for tonight thank you um venerable venerable kamalaksha i'll throw back to you um if you'd like to finish um with a blessing or however you think appropriate okay i think it it would be really nice if we did some loving kindness meditation together um you know more and more i think whatever the question love is the answer and all of the complications that we encounter in life all the difficulties ultimately can be resolved through love and our conflicted emotions and so forth also can be quieted down by this practice of metta loving kindness and especially in the world today what we're seeing people going through tremendous suffering and all the suffering of uncertainty and it's it's this is the way that we can maintain our own sanity and also be a, a resource for others in the world so let's do a little loving kindness meditation together just a few minutes yeah cuz i know our time is almost finished but let's sit quietly comfortably relax comfortable in the present moment and imagine our whole body and mind filled with loving kindness so we like we can visualize it in the form of a gentle golden light that permeates every cell of our body every moment of our thoughts we become pure loving kindness then we expand that loving kindness out to everyone on the chat our virtual community buddhist women and maybe there's some men all of us completely filled with loving kindness Now we share that strong pure loving kindness with everyone in our area our home our neighborhood our town our state or province people we like people we don't really care for so much imagine each and every one of them completely filled with loving kindness And then expand it out even further to reach 
even the farthest ends of the earth and all the living beings on this beautiful planet. Imagine all of them filled with loving kindness. Remember especially those who are suffering from this and other physical ailments. From fear. Anxiety. uncertainty poverty oppression conflict Loneliness, frustration, imagine all of these sufferings replaced with peace. ease and happiness. May all living beings on earth be well and happy. May they all be free from suffering. And we rejoice in all the good deeds we have done. Even during this teleconference, all our good thoughts, our good motivation, our meditation. And dedicate the merit of all those wholesome actions of body, speech, and mind. all sentient beings throughout space and time. Mm -hmm.
by virtue of the merit that we have accumulated. May we achieve the state of perfect awakening in order to liberate all living beings from suffering, leaving not one behind. Thank you. Venerable Karma Legshe, thank you. And on behalf of Sakadita Australia and on behalf of all our virtual participants today, we've got people from Spain and Singapore and all around the world. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Goodbye, you. everyone. <laughs>
Thank you. Hope to see you all there. I think that's it. That it? <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Stay well. Stay safe. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thanks, Helen. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Helen. Bye. 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 bye.